Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone, viewing, especially our viewing and listening audience. This is the sixth meeting of the Joint Select Committee on Finance and Legal Affairs. Today, the committee is convened the second public hearing pursuant to the inquiry into the state's strategy for implementing unproclaimed legislation passed by parliament during the last 20 years. On the last occasion, we met with stakeholders responsible for the implementation of the Planning and Facilitation of Development Act. And today's session, we will focus on the implementation of the Data Protection Act, Chapter 2204, Act Number 13 of 2011. We will be asking members of the listening and viewing audience we want you to participate, so we invite you to post or send your comments via the Parliament's various social media platforms, Facebook page, PalView, Parliament YouTube channel, and Twitter. At this point, I would want to welcome the officials of the Office of the Prime Minister who, will, who are with us today, and I invite them to introduce themselves. Good morning, Madam Chair. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Maurice Sweet, Permanent Secretary in your, to the Prime Minister. And with you, your team, please. Um, my team with me, I have the Deputy Permanent Secretary, um, Savitri Balkaran, um, Mr. Devon Phillips, Phillips, sorry, our Senior Legal Advisor, and Mr. Chadwick Noel, or FOI officer with responsibility for research. I'm, I'm sorry, Chair, I'm not hearing you. I'm sorry. So welcome, glad to have you with us, officials of the Office of the Prime Minister. I am Hazel Thompson Ahi, Chair of this committee. I now ask members of the committee to introduce themselves. Good morning, I'm Jansi Lashmidial, member. Good morning, Keith Scotland, member. Good morning, Marvin Gonzalez, member. Good morning. Hassel Bakas, member. The inquiry objectives are to determine the factors that are contributing to the delay in the full proclamation of the Data Protection Act, Chapter 2204. This is Act Number 13 of 2011. Two, the sections of the Act that can be implemented without delay. Three, the sections of the Act that require more time and or input for operationalization and the impact that the delay in the full proclamation of the act has had on data protection. So these are our four objectives for today. So that we've had that act since 2011, we are now in 2021. Now I know that we are sometimes called the land of limbo, but I don't think that that was what was intended, that we are going to have things in limbo, especially things that are important as what this Data Protection Act is about. 
Because when we're talking about data, we're talking about things that impact your life. We're talking about protecting your data, which is really protecting your right to privacy, which is an entrenched part of the constitution, your right to privacy. We collect a lot of data and how is that protected? We living in a digital environment. So more and more, we have data that is coming into the hands of government and other officials, and we need to have that data protected. All kinds of documents, photos, videotape, machine readable documents, our passports, our birth certificates, a number of pieces of data which impact us, your, your educational records, criminal records, medical records, financial transaction, DNA, all of those things. So we talk about the information bank. How are we going to go ahead with this legislation, which will be protecting our data? A number of countries have legislation to protect their data. The UK claims that it has a worldwide class, world-class data protection regime. And they've recently amended their thing to, to post Brexit so that they can not deal with everything that was there before they left Brexit. So we now ask for opening statement, just two minutes from the permanent secretary to the prime minister, office of the prime minister and head of the public service. So Mr. Sweet, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, well, you would have given us the, the background and the opening statement with respect to the purpose of the committee. Um, the committee would have provided pertinent questions to the Office of the Prime Minister for which we would have provided written responses. So I wouldn't want to touch on those, but leave it for the members who have further, if they have further questions and want any further clarification. I would, however, like to take the opportunity to update the committee with your permission, Chair, on the current status of the implement, with regards to the implementation of the Data Protection Act. Um, in December 2019, the then Ministry of, Communi Ministry of Communication was asked by the Ministry of Trade and Industry to collaborate on amending the Act. The amendment to the Data Protection Act is of mutual interest to the Ministry of Trade and Industry as it forms part of its mandate to improve trade performance and enhance the business competitiveness of Trinidad and Tobago through the strengthening and transformation of the single economic window, which is branded as TT BizLink, into a world class solution based on international standards. In achieving the full operationalization of the single economic window, the act needed to be harmonized in line with the EU GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation that governs operations in, in the European Union to ensure a smooth flow of data um, in international trade transactions. Now, the Ministry of Trade and Industry offered to assist the then Ministry of Communication in financing the project through an Inter-American Development Bank loan for the strengthening of the single economic window for trade and business facilitation, the trade and business facilitation program. In December of 2020, the consultant would have finalized the inception report. In January of 2021, a gap analysis report was completed. In February 2021, a draft legislative brief was prepared. In March 2021, there was a stakeholder consultations and a regulatory impact assessment. And the consultant has delivered a presentation to the Office of the Prime Minister on the initial findings with respect to the regulatory impact assessment and the stakeholder consultations and some of the preliminary points and findings which were raised in those consolidations, sorry, consultations 
would have been included in the OPM's written response to questions raised by the committee. Um, in this month, April 2021, we anticipate that we would be receiving, well, the Ministry of Trade, through the consultant, would be receiving our finalized legislative brief. In June 2021, we anticipate the receipt of draft legislation and regulations. And July 2021, we'll have the anticipated uh, presentation to stakeholders with a final proposed legislation and regulations for August 2021 and um, the, the end of that project that is being undertaken by the Ministry of Trade in September 2021. So, um, so there are quite so there are some things that have already started this year and taking place. Um, and I'll, well, I'll just leave that for now and to go into the details later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sweet, for your update. I, I, I noticed a lot of the update um, has happened quite recently. And um, I, I, maybe the buttons have been pushed, but we're happy to hear that there is some progress. Um, and we hope that this very important piece of legislation will come on board very soon. So we will commence questioning with respect to this status. And I'd like to remind committee members to direct their questions and concerns through the chair and activate the microphone on your devices when they acknowledge, when you acknowledge and turn it off when you have concluded your contribution. So we do morning. have some questions. Morning, Good Madam morning. Chair. Terence Yang here, just uh, registering my presence this morning. Thank you very much. We welcome you, sir. You know how very busy you are these days. And um, we're glad that you're able to make it. Madam Chair, if I may, may I begin? Member Bacchus here. Yes, Member Bacchus, proceed. Okay, so in in the in the written submissions at, at the very beginning, uh, in identifying some of the issues that would have led to this prolonged period of time for proclamation, the table that was provided initially that stretched from July 12, twenty eleven, all the way to August sixteenth, would have identified the fact that this legislation would have moved around within ministries, and, and I think there are seven or eight different instances within the table. All of them were underpinned by uh, the Ministry of Communications being uh, a part of it. Is there a, a, a belief or a direct association with the Data Protection Act, specifically as it relates to the Ministry of Communication uh, from then to now, and is that still the case? And in your opening statement, the, the idea that the Ministry of Communication was approached by the Ministry of Trade. And in the submission, you have this uh, number of separate entities impacting on this. How, how, how do you reconcile this? Is this something that is tied specifically to the Office uh, the Ministry of, of, of Communication? Should it remain that way? And uh, how are you dealing with the number of of agencies, divisions, and ministries that would be impacted or are being impacted by this particular piece of legislation. I'll start there. Okay. Chair, through you. Um, well, I, I wouldn't go into the, the allocation of portfolios as a club of my pay grade. I would say that um, the Data Protection Act there, there's a, there was seen as some sort of nexus between the Data Protection Act and the Freedom of Information Act in terms of privacy of data versus providing data that was in the realm, the realm of, of, of government agencies and departments. And the Freedom of Information Act fell under the communications. So whether it's Ministry of Communication or communication as part of different ministries. 
I suppose because of that thinking, every time the portfolio changed with Ministry of Communication, the Data Protection Act changed accordingly. Um, there is in the, um, the Gazette where the Ministry of Public Administration and Data Digital Transformation has a role to play in terms of developing policies as it relates to data protection. So there's some nexus in terms of the Data Protection Act with public, um, public administration, um, Ministry of Trade, and well, communication. So it does span a lot of different ministries. Um, the Ministry of Trade got involved because they were looking at the Electronic Transactions Act, but of course data protection impacts upon it. So there is a lot of different ministries are impacted. And I think one of the issues that we would, that the consultant would have raised was pro probably the need for having another act which should have preceded both the FOI and the Data Protection Act, which was dealing with um, classification of data and, and, and that sort of thing. So there are quite a few things that impact not just, it's, the, it's, it's a government-wide issue and it in fact impacts different ministries and not only um, the collection policy, et cetera. So I, I hope, I, and the other thing I just wanted to touch on in the opening statement of the chair would have raised um, instances of government gathering of data and the protection and privacy of that data. And I just want to point out that the Data Protection Act covers both government and the private sector and the use of personal data. Uh, and I'm sure again through you, uh, the, it's also understood, and the, 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 the scope of the consultant while engaged uh, through you on, with a specific focus from the Ministry of Trade as it relates to them being compliant to deal with things uh, on the international side, I assume that the, the consultant and all the results that you've been getting really cover data protection as a global thing within the, the, the context within Trinidad and Tobago and not just specific to uh, the, the, the piece associated with or the primary mandate piece associated with the Ministry of Trade. Um, Madam Chair, yes, that's a, that's a correct assessment. Um, it, the, when looking at the, the, the act was taken as a whole um, and the, the coming out of the consultation, there are a lot of issues were raised in terms of the, the role of the, the Commissioner of Information or the Information Commissioner, um, the, the impact of that legislation, other pieces of legislation. So it, it took a very holistic approach to it. So it wasn't just focus simply on Ministry of Trade meeting their objectives, but it, it looked at the Act as a whole and other pieces of legislation that may have to be amended or adjusted to make it all functional. And I'll give you for now, and, and uh, I'll come with some others after, please. You were saying something else, sir? No, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll give way for now so others can get in and I, I can resume uh, subsequently. Thank you. Mr. Sweet, as you mentioned, the Commissioner, there were some concerns expressed that the, um, one of the comments, I believe, that the Commissioner being one person should not be the, just one person to determine, you know, the data protection, but that there should be a board. Has the thinking change over time about that that responsibility being in the hands of one person as opposed to a group of persons so that there would be you know different views expressed madam chair those were views coming out that was view in some quarters coming out of the public consultation that's not government's position and that was just out of the stakeholder consultation, there were some persons who expressed that view and the consultants will review and, and look at it. And I presume they would look at other jurisdictions and what apply there, as well as you have to look at the relevance and the applicability in Toronto Tobago, because we, we may have smaller jurisdictions 
Um, so in terms of our panel here versus a single person and the administrative framework. So that's something that the consultant will look at based on feedback coming from the public or stakeholders. So, so what you're saying in essence is that there is no view yet. You're waiting for what the consultants will recommend. Yeah? Yes, we would wait till the consultant make their recommendations and then we would review. Um, I suppose at that point we'll have to, from the ministry perspective, go to cabinet to get signed off on a view. I see. Thank you. Madam Chair, might I follow up on that on that question, please? Just as it relates to the information commissioner. Yes, you may. Uh, so part of the role, so the, the role of the information commissioner, and apart from its com its composition, has to be determined at how many people and so on, whether committee or otherwise, as in the submission, has within it a number of under its its purview a number of things that affect. Uh, the way in which digital government will work um not just in terms of data protection for as as, as an item but it spreads across other things including uh, exchange of information etc cetera, etc cetera. is all of that uh even though the, the piece of the the, the 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 proclamation piece required for the information commissioner is already done is all of that also under the review of the the consultant uh, with potential to change Yes, the consultant had looked at that as well in terms of sharing of information between ministries and departments and what would be the correct framework. And so that was also taken up. And again, that was one of the part of the thinking in terms of that piece of legislation where they spoke about data classification and storage of data because it felt if that was clarified, and you had common definitions, of course, then some of those other issues in terms of sharing and open data policies and things like that would be addressed. So all of that was part of what the consultant was looking at as well. Yep, thank you. Member Media. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, through you, I just have a few questions. Um, Coming from, I just, well, just want to come back from what uh, Minister Bacchus is asking about. Um, just specifically, is the consultant also looking at overseas obligations, like under treaties and our obligations to share data across specifically tax information? Is that something that the consultant is also engaged um, in to, to consider and the impact on whether or not we need to amend the laws? Is that part of the remit of the consultant? Okay, Madam Chair. Um would not have been looking specifically like tax information treaties that would be covered separately. Um, and probably I would ask the either Ms. one one of the one of my technical people to come in. Um, what the con what the consultant started looking at was in terms of the requirements like the European Union with their general um, data protection regulations, because when you do in trade is not only local trade but also international trade and therefore for those companies to share information or, or individuals sharing information with us they would have to be sure that we have a certain level of compliance in what is required with them so so that is the context in which, which they were looking at international requirements rather than specific things like under the tax information etc right my concern is um yes um that if we have to fully proclaim the data protection act we would need to ensure that there's no conflict between the provisions of data protection and our international obligations i, I just throw out tax as an example it just came on the top of my head but i'm sure that there are other treaties and international agreements and obligations and so on that might require us to share information so um i just put it out there to find out if all of this is under consideration as well um so perhaps it's something we could consider uh, moving forward and maybe we would um, consider for our report. Um, you raised in your submission about concerns with respect to press freedom. And I think this is also tied in somewhat to freedom of information, which is also becoming um, a tool that the press is using um, more regularly now. Um, some litigation and so on has, has been embarked upon. Um, specifically, 
you know, what are the major concerns that you all have identified with respect to the um, press freedom issue? And um, is that, uh, is it, are there any amendments being considered or any alternative proposals being considered for a, a formula that would not impact upon press freedom? Okay, um, Madam Chair, um, okay, Those, the concerns with respect to press freedom won't raise by your officer, the Prime Minister, but raised by the stakeholders. Sure. Um, right? Um, I don't know, I would probably want to ask um, Mr. Noel or, or, um, or Mr. Philip to come in at, at this point because um, I, I looked at the act and I, I well, as a lay person, I couldn't find what what the um the, the specific issues that were that the press was raising, which was but, but the issues raised by stakeholders were raised with you, correct? Or well, with the yeah, they, were, well, they were raised at, uh, with the consult with the well, the consultant and Mr. Noel would have been okay. at the, at the sure. consultation. So I yeah. don't. Know so I maybe could, Mr. Noel yeah. could give us yeah. an explanation as to what was some of the concerns, just so we understand them ourselves. All right, sure. So um. At this point, um, Madam Chair, through you, I'd like to invite either Mr. Philip or Mr. Noel, if they could clarify, bring some clarification on what would the issues raise. Mr. Philip. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, the consultants, the stakeholder consultations, which were held recently, members of the media raised the issue that the dissemination, sometimes they come into um, data or personal information in the course of their investigative journalism. And they felt that if it was proclaimed in its, in its state now, it would impact upon freedoms, impact upon the press freedom, and that they would be held liable for the holding of personal information. So they wanted an exception placed within the, the act to cater for those that those that um, conduct investigative journalism and so on. And that is being considered as part of the consultancy and the consultant will make recommendations with regards to that. Mr. Philip, are you able, you or Mr. Sweet, to share with us the terms of reference for the consultancy, either today or at a later date? Are you able to share it now? It might stave off some of the questions. Yeah. Madam Chair, um, we we would provide it at a at a later date um, in writing because it, it it covers a whole lot of, of of areas and too much to mention at this point in time off the top of my head. But we can't. But we would provide it for you in writing. I'm obliged. Thank you so very much. We look forward to receiving it. Yes, Madam Chair. Great. Um. One other question, with respect to resourcing for specifically the public service, because of course there's, um, I think, a, a heavier burden placed on the public sector with respect to the protection of data. Um, and there are two aspects to this. There's resourcing in order to become compliant, and then there's also resourcing in order to ensure compliance. Um, so would be firstly has there been any sort of assessment done with respect to what type of resources would be needed by all it's a very wide range of public authorities um that would be captured by this act when it is fully proclaimed and in order to get them all compliant it would take a massive effort i think to have the facilities the technology um the know-how the training all of that in order to become compliant with the act and to not run afoul of the act and of course that's something we don't want the state to be doing has there been an assessment of the the, the cost factor involved and that would be involved in order to get every public agency compliant with this act in its present form not notwithstanding that it's being reviewed all right ma'am um, chair um i i don't think well, I can say in terms of costing, I don't think it's been costed as yet. I know that there have been discussions in terms of one is that training and awareness and that culture of the data privacy and how to use and the data and the compliance with the, with the legislation. I think um, Mr. 
Mr. Noel, who was doing the research has been involved, could probably give you a little more detail in terms of what has been done so far in terms of consultation with ministries and departments. Thank you very much um, to you, Madam Chair. Um, basically, the Freedom of Information Unit, as was mentioned before, will normally have responsibility for data, well, freedom of information in the first instance, which we engage public authority on an ongoing basis in terms of our education drive, as well as we, in the past, would have presented just some basic information in terms of data protection. So what we would have done is inform public authorities about the Data Protection Act and very basic um, share with them the general privacy principles and the need to become compliant in the act in going forward when it is fully proclaimed. So that is what we have been doing, bringing some level of awareness, telling people about the Data Protection Act, because a number of public authorities and public officers were not aware that the act is in existence. So we brought that kind of awareness over time. And so this is my next question, which comes out from that. Um, and it links back to FOIA. Um, what about making sure, even before the act is proclaimed and when it is ultimately proclaimed, compliance? Because up to now, we see with FOIA, which has been fully proclaimed and operational since 1999, I think, um, that we have many public authorities not in compliance. We have a ton of litigation and a lot of money being spent in costs and other things because ministries don't comply. Um, if you were to do a survey right now of how many ministries have not issued the public statement they're required to do and who have no alternate FYE officer and, and all of these things, it might shock you. So to ensure that we aren't going down the same road with data protection when it is proclaimed, who is going to take the responsibility to ensure that public authorities are compliant with the requirements of data protection? Is that something within your contemplation right now or is it something that has to be fleshed out? Anybody? Mr. Sweet? <laughs> okay, I was looking to, to Mr. Noel. Um, part, part of the, in terms of compliance, that is where the, the Office of the Information Commissioner would come in. In terms of the preparation carrying it forward, well, the, that would fall under the purview of the Office of the Prime Minister, and we would have to work in conjunction with the Ministry of Public Administration in terms of getting persons to that level of compliance and preparedness moving forward. Uh, Chair, can I ask a question? Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, Minister, just one quick thing. So just to be clear, there will be a compliance unit within the office of the OIC. That is, that is within the structure that's contemplated for the office of the um, information commissioner. Well, in the, under, under the act, the the, it has certain obligations and certain duties that the Office of the Information Commissioner would have to carry out in terms of dealing with compliance and things. But in terms of preparedness, that would be something that the, the ministry would, would have to deal with. When, when I say the Office of the Prime Minister, because that would be part of the project in terms of getting ready for the for the um, full assent of, of the sorry, the full proclamation of the act. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, Minister, you can go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Chair. Can I go ahead? Yes, please, Mr. Gonzalez, proceed. Yeah, um, just a question to, um, to P.S. Sweet and his team. Now, looking at the comments of the, the consultant, one can easily come to the conclusion that the consultant is expressing grave concern with the present status and the, um, the present status of the Data Protection Act. The act in its current context and the potential problems that can arise if the act were to be proclaimed in its current state. So I'm getting the impression that the consultant is suggesting that we have a lot of work to do and perhaps might be suggesting an, an, a complete overhaul of the Data Protection Act um, and looking at our current context, other pieces of legislation that came into existence after the act um, was passed and perhaps the need to have um, a data protection act that can work seamlessly with other pieces of legislation, especially in the context 
in which we are going towards digitization and digitalization. Now, I'm listening to the other um, members on PS Suite's team, and they seem to be putting systems in place that um, the current Data Protection Act is catering for, but why is at the same time trying to, 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 to grasp as to what direction are we going? Are we, are we deciding to stay in the, in the current context of the Data Protection Act, or is there a need to, to move in a, in, in, a, in a different direction as is being suggested by the consultant. So I'm not too clear where we are um, as a country, as a state, um, as a public service, as to whether or not we are, we are seeking to implement the act in its current form, or we are going in a different direction, a different thrust, and, um, and, and before we seek to, towards putting implementation strategies in place. If, if I may chair, um, the consultant would have identified numerous shortfalls or things that need to adjust in the Data Protection Act. Some of the things would have covered like the development of technology over time, bringing in FinTech and blockchain and, and, whether, and the ability of the act to, to address some of those issues and big data and artificial intelligence and more few. So there, there are some things in the act, remember it's between 2011 and 2021, that's a long time when you're dealing with information technology. So a lot of things would have changed. Correct. And then you have some of the issues that would have been raised at these stakeholder consultation, like press freedom, et cetera, which is also something that's developing and changing as we have a more open and transparent see, demands based on government. But what, so, and then of course, the, the, the way the office is structured is something that's also being looked at. You mean the way in which it's proposed? In, in which it's proposed, right? Is, is what they're, sorry, is what they're looking at. But what, what we were discussing in terms of sensitizing the public, because some of those things would have taken place like two years ago before this consultancy start, is really dealing with the general principles of data privacy, et cetera, and getting that, that knowledge, that understanding, that appreciation, I suppose. So we are not, at this point, looking to implement the Data Protection Act as it currently stands, given that we know we are fully aware that a consultancy is going on and, and there are these deficiencies or things that, that have been highlighted. So, so what we're looking at in terms of, us, I think, the general principle of privacy of data and sharing of data and, and those things wouldn't change. It's really the, the mechanism. So, so, we, so I, I don't think it's fair to say that we're rushing ahead to implement it as it currently exists and then having to, to change it. Change I'm, it. I'm worried because the con based on the comments by a consultant, mm -hmm. um, they somehow seem to be suggesting that we have a lot of more, we have much more work to do, all right, before we implement, all right, and to, to ensure seamless implementation. And, and, and somehow the discussion seemed to be going in a different direction, which is about um, implementing what you currently have. So, it's, 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 the, the messaging is conflicting, but we as a state, as a country, we need to know exactly which direction in which um, that we intend to go before we can start an implementation strategy or even educating the public. Yes, you want the public to be aware and to be cognizant of the need to protect data. But why are you educating the public if you don't know what direction in which you're going? Okay. Um, when Mr. Noel spoke, he would have spoken of something that would have happened in, I think it was 2019, was when we, we would have had some of that initial discussion. Yeah. So that's just giving historical context of what has been done so far. Yeah. But in terms of an, an immediate um consultation no we, we haven't reached to that point because as i said in my my opening statement we still have to go back to the public with the, the um proposed legislative amendments and things like that so but that, yes but yes sorry to cut you but don't you think that we're at a juncture now especially with the the the, the reality of covid and the thrust of the of countries all over and 
and business to, to you know towards digitization and digitalization that now the country is required to come up with a firm policy on data protection that will inform whatever legislative structure that you need to move forward with um, as opposed to wasting time and trying to nitpick wh whether or not this this 2011 data protection act can possibly work can possibly work in, in in the grand scheme of things right now it is clear based on the information provided to the to the to the um the, to the committee that what currently exists um may not be workable based on the concerns expressed across the board and therefore let us utilize the opportunity to finalize a policy that will inform legislation moving forward our time might be better spent on finalizing the policy and legislation so that we can have data protection within the shortest time possible. I, I, I agree with you. Um, and it, it really, but there are a lot of things that need to be done and it's really doing something simultaneously. I, I think um, I probably should share, you have the Ministry of Public Administration and Digital Transformation and their whose portfolio data protection policies and frameworks um, which impact God's um, digital transformation initiatives. And so under that ministry, they, they're looking at the, the open source policy, remote working, data strategy, or open government policy, and a lot of different things. So, so it's really calls for a lot more coordination of these different initiatives. And it's, it's a lot broader than simply OPM and the Data Protection Act because it impacts trade, public administration. So it's really, yes, I agree with you. You need to have that policy properly spelled out yes. before you, you, you go into full implementation. And, and then rather the consultant that you have, I, I don't know if that is part of the remit and if the, um, the draft comes of reference can be submitted to the committee, I guess we'll be um, further informed. Mm -hmm. But I think you need to go back to our fundamentals, which is a, a clear policy paper on data protection in Trinidad and Tobago in light of all that has transpired over the last um, five to 10 years, more so now with COVID. I think it might be more feasible and it might make better sense to look at this from a policy perspective, all right? Ensuring that we, we, we are catering for all the stakeholders across the board and once we, we are firm with that, then it will be easy to come up with legislation for full implementation. I, I, I hear you. Chair, Chair I, I, I hear what the member is saying, and it's something that we'll, we'll have to take on, on board. Um, I just want to remind it that the consultant was engaged, well, we'll share the terms of reference, but the consultant would have engaged through Ministry of Trade for specific issue, and then things would have sort of unfold and, and these issues that you are raising is yes. what will come out to the front. I think now that these issues have been raised, it's an appropriate time to really examine what it is you, you are speaking into. Correct, right. because I'm member Lassie had asked the question initially, mm -hmm. and I was of the view, and I think you confirm that position now, that that consultant is working on, um, um, on, on more or less seeking the interests of Ministry of Trade, if I'm to, to, to refer to it like that. All right, um, but I think where we are as a country, we need to look at it from a more holistic perspective, which will also impact positively on Ministry of Trade as well as all the other government agencies and private sector. So uh, it's it seems as though I guess when we get the um, the terms of reference, we will be further educated. But I'm getting the impression that this consultant is more looking at the Data Protection Act. From the from the context of the Ministry of Trade and what has to be done um, for the full implementation of the the, um, the the single economic window, as 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 you highlighted earlier on, but I think where we are as a country and what has transpired over the last five years, last two years, and the other pieces of legislation that we've passed, the Electronic Transactions Act and and so many other pieces of legislation, the the, the extent of the reforms that took place in the licensing department with digitization and online, um, and, and online transactions, all dealing with data and the data of citizens. I think the issue of the Data Protection Act and a clear data protection policy is critical 
and it should be looked at in that context. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Now, Mr. Mr. Sweet, tell us, in the absence of this legislation, what are the risks to the public? How is it impacting the public at present? Um, I, I think I want to defer to the, <laughs> my senior legal officer, Mr. Phillips, and respond to that question. Thank you, Chair. Madam Chair, well, <clears throat> honestly speaking, the majority of the Data Protection Act, as it now stands, is unproclaimed. But public bodies and, 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 and private sector is guided by the privacy principles. So we, 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 we hope that the majority of the private sector is abiding by the, the, the general privacy principles as enunciated in the Act. Oh. You know, sometimes when we hope we die in despair, eh? So we really have to get moving on this. Now, um, <clears throat> the UK has set quite a bit of store by what happens in, in Gibraltar. They talk about the legislative framework put together by officials in the government of Gibraltar. And they, they you know, they are, their new act, when I say new act, because Britain would have had, UK would have had data protection since the 1970s, and now they have the 2018 Act. So have you all been looking to see what improvements over the years um, have taken place within the UK and, and perhaps look at what was happening, has happened in Gibraltar that they speak so highly of, to see that maybe that could short circuit a lot of what we're trying to do, you know, to put up a, a properly uh, uh, an act in place that has a proper framework that, that deals, you know, and abides by all the conditions because, I mean, privacy concerns have been there since the United Nations Declaration uh, so that um, on human rights. So it's nothing new. And a number of countries have data protection legislation. So I am not so sure as to what is happening that Trinidad is being kept back like that when perhaps what we need to do is to look very closely at what has happened in other jurisdictions to see what we can emulate and then what we cannot, we just adapt to our local conditions. And um, I wanna ask though, how is the delay affecting if at all the rollout of more extensive e-government services? A lot has been happening in terms of the Register General this office and the court system, you know, but tell me, so those two things I want you to look at, to what extent is delay affecting the other services that will are impacted by this legislation? I, I don't think that this, this specific piece of legislation really delays and impacts significantly on the implementation of those um, initiatives in various ministries and departments. Because we, we focus, we, we tend when we look at the, the IT and we, we think it's something different than what we were doing before. I mean, I look, this information has always been in, in the government's possession or the public authority's possession in terms of what you're using, all all you're doing now is storing in a different medium that makes it more readily accessible. I think when a lot of these initiatives, in terms of what is being done, let us say, like licensing or the or the registers department, when when it becomes impacted is when we start to look at things like digital signatures or electronic payment systems, and and that is when they, they sort of get delayed when you have to try and tweak various pieces of legislation. But in terms of the actual data protection itself, I, I don't think that the, the act itself is delaying the, the implementation. What, what, what we're really looking at is what, what the Data Protection Act would do is in terms of reducing the risk 
or by causing persons to put in certain measures in order to comply with the act. And what it does is reduces the risk of your, your private data going out there. And you would find that a lot of entities, both public and private, when they put data because of their, you'll be that awareness of the risk in terms of being loss of data that the, the, from an IT level, you will try to put certain measures in place to safeguard and protect the data within your purview because one, they would want to do it to protect themselves as well because each firm or each organization want to protect their reputation against suffering a data breach and the loss of data. So you have their own self-interest as well as trying to protect the customer or the, the client or, or the user who has provided that data. So what the legislation, when it's fully proclaimed, would provide a proper legislative framework, but I don't think it, it stalls or, or delays completely. I mean, it, it would have certain hindrances, but I don't think it that completely delays the implementation of those measures. Chair, can I ask a further question? Yes, you may. Chair, I think you, you asked a, a pertinent question of um, the senior legal um, counsel, that is Mr. Philip, in the context of, in the absence of data protection, how does that impact and expose the citizens of this country? I think it's a very serious matter because not too long ago, I think it was a couple of years ago, we have heard um, in reported in, in the parliament of the UK and, and in the US Congress, where um, certain international agencies um, had access to the data of the citizens of this country from state agencies, like the Registrar General Department, from um, the, the, the TSTT, the, some of the utility companies, where the people of this, the citizens of this country started receiving emails and text messages in an election campaign. And it was clear that there were some significant breaches of the, the privacy of citizens by external agencies getting access to the data of the citizens of, um, of this country by state agencies. So the, I think your question is very pertinent because we in Trinidad and Tobago have been victims or potential victims of invasion by external agents, perhaps working with, 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 with politicians or political organizations where they got access to the data of citizens for, 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 for political campaigns. And therefore, if there was one particular incident that should have led to the, the people of this country and the parliament and the government um, ensuring that this Data Protection Act is taken up, it is dust off, and um, it is fully implemented. I think it was it, it would have been this particular occasion. So I want to draw to the fact that I think your question is important. It is very pertinent because outside of data protection, the 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 the, the privacy of our citizens is is seriously and significantly compromised. Quite so. Just yesterday, one of my colleagues purported, you know, I, I received an email and I, I responded yeah. only to get an email from her, yeah. you know, the lawyer saying, don't respond to this. Exactly. From telling another person, another lawyer, don't respond. This is not me. Exactly. You see? So, I mean, exactly. that, that um, it was kind of frightening, you know, to see that she said my, it has been hacked sure. and we, so we've been having problems all the time. I mean, there's no requirement also for encryption of signatures, you know, and people are doing online purchases. Yeah. The, the best bank, performing bank from the newspaper reports in Trinidad and Tobago said to me a couple of days ago, you know, you, um, we're not allowing this because we have a problem with fraud. Yeah. And, you know, so a lot of things are happening. And then, you know, I said, well, let it, go to say, okay, we will release and, and let it go through. And then it, it was verified that the purchase was all right. But this particular company you're dealing with, we have a problem with fraud. So yeah. they're trying to protect me by, you know, saying you can't do this purchase. So you see that um, a lot is happening. Lot so is we happening. really need to get those laws in place. Correct. Chair, I would also want to share briefly that um, just early on this week, I had a, a tour at the main TT Post head office in Piaco. 
And, um, and it was part of the, the, the rollout and the implementation of TTPO's new S42 addressing system, where they undertook an exercise over the last um, five or seven years to come up with this new addressing system using GPS technology and what have you. And this, the information that is now in TTPO's possession with respect to the address of citizens is so powerful. And I asked that critical question, what protocols do you have in place now within the organization to protect this very sensitive data from being breached by external forces? And you would be shocked to know that there's absolutely no protocols. So there's no internal protocols and we don't have a data protection policy and a data protection act to protect the citizens of this country. I have mandated TTPOS to immediately come up with a system to protect the data because I told them that maybe next four years, I wouldn't be sitting in this position. There might be someone else with ulterior motives and ulterior agenda that is going to take this data and victimize the people of this country. Chair, sure, if, if I may. <laughs> Please sure. proceed. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I, I heard the, the minister's reference to TT posts and names and addresses of individuals. Um, if I wanted the names and addresses of individuals, I wouldn't go to TT posts. I would go on the election and boundaries website and download the election rules and get the names and addresses of everyone over the age of 18. It's publicly available. <laughs> A lot of the time, yeah, the format, and, and there are some people using those rules for marketing purposes already. And because we don't have data protection and data protection policy. Well, people. well, the election boundaries would post that information because they're required by law to make the information available. What IT does is because you can mine data from different places and then collate with what you already have, and there, there are a lot of things you can to once with little pieces of information they gather from different places. So the, the rules and those things are public public information, but no one really would have bothered because before they were manual. <laughs> no, but now it's electronic and you can go on the internet and download it. And and that that's what is happening. And and you see and you see PS suite and again it, it, it comes back to the issue that we've raised that given the, the direction in which we are going in this digital world and the pace at which we are going, um, yes, information is readily available and I agree with you. And that's the reason why we need to put the Data Protection Act and policy on steroids to make sure that it keeps up with that fast pace and the evolution in which we are, that we are moving towards at this digital world. So, more, so we can't be floundering and tweaking and and just you know, looking at ways in which we can partially proclaim, no, no, things are happening quickly and we need to be very clear in the direction which, in which we, we need to go as a country where data protection is concerned. Madam Chair? Sorry? My time. Yes. My time, Madam Chair? Yes. Proceed. Yes, so a so couple of things, and, and, and I want to, to point this out uh, to, to all involved in the committee. We, we must ensure that we understand the delineation between uh, data protection and the cybersecurity component of protecting information. The, 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 while there is some correlation to the two, they are not the same. Uh, Chair, Madam Chair, what you described really and truly is about breaches, security breaches within known solutions, which should be addressed by uh, the appropriate uh, cybersecurity protocols. That is something that is, it represents a different type of risk in the dealing with digital government. Uh, data protection on the other hand deals with, with some with other components of that. So I, I wanna make that delineation. The other thing is, and and what 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 Mama Gonzalez said is, is is interesting because of the response. The idea that something is available does not give you the right to manipulate. So and that is part of data protection. So while something is readily available, you can you see it all the time, particularly in in, in items of entertainment. You can consume it, yeah, sure, right. You can use it for no other purpose. 
So inside of our laws, we have to address that aspect of what it is as well. And it will be addressed once we do it properly, and we will. The other thing about hindrance and, and whether or not the non-proclamation of this cause, it may not, in, in as, as, as PS would have said, because we can go ahead and do things. The issue you're going to have is in the back end. When the proclamation comes, if you've done things, that would be at variance or in violation of what is there in your design and build of your digital solutions, you then find yourself in a dilemma. An example would be the, the information commissioner, which will define the rules that regulate the exchange of information across ministries. There's nothing stopping you from doing it now. When that comes into force and, it, and, and the rules are set, if you are found to be in violation of that, now you're talking about rework to readjust. Uh, but what I want to ask uh, PS and, and team, there are a number of current things that are happening that whether under data protection or data sovereignty, I'm not sure, but I want to get your view on it. Things specific to cloud services, storage of data and the manipulation of data in a, via external agents and in other countries but data that still actually is resident here or that has been exported there, where does that sit? Is that under consideration of where it is or is that exclusively under data sovereignty? sovereignty? And then of course, the question of AI, which is the manipulation of data, which is not necessarily whether or not the data is protected or not, but how that data is being used in terms of decision making. And so where does that fit in, 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 in the scheme of what we're discussing? And of course, a CARICOM regional wide spin on this from a data protection perspective as a region. How, how would you respond to those things? When the, the, when the consultant met with the stakeholders, they would have gotten um, comments or responses from the Ministry of Public Administration and Data Transformation. And they would have addressed a lot of those issues in their comments. And, and that is something that the, the consultant is also looking at in terms of making recommendations. So, so that's that's something that we're kind of waiting on in terms of the final report to see how, how it is addressed or what are the proposals. So it, it is really an assimilation to create a position based on, on other stakeholder ministries, divisions, and agencies that will inform us how that goes. Yes. Okay. Madam Chair, thank you. The submission of the OPM noted that stakeholders sought clarification for the use of predictive analysis and profiling. Tell me, Mr. Sweet, if you can, for what purposes do government, the public sector agencies propose to utilize predictive analysis? I, um, I, I don't think we are proposed to use predictive analysis. I think the stakeholders were looking at current trends because again, the, the Data Protection Act is for both government and private sector use of data. And I think the stakeholders are looking at current trends by big data companies like Facebook, WhatsApp, where they sort of collect and, and look at data and make those sort of analysis. And I think they're, they're looking at what protection the, the act would have in terms of using and those that information. Thank you. A, a quick follow, Madam Chair, on, on just on that point. Please do. Yes. So again, the the manipulation of data uh, for for any particular purpose, whether and, and in predictive case. In the private sector, it is more to create things like attractive index, attractiveness indexes that will tell you where to target your products. In the government sector, it is really about, and the public sector is really about uh, getting the correct information, getting the correct data sets, and then using it to help in decision making. So, so that is where, where that sits. The thing about data protection and, and, and this was a question I think it showed up in some parts of, of the, is whether or not data protection is going to be viewed as a hindrance or that it is going to be viewed as help 
in this digital government trust. And when I say digital government, it includes all of the pieces associated with the private sector. Is, is, it, is it the view of, of, of PS and his, and his team that it is being perceived as a helping thing or hindrance in terms of where we're going uh, towards this digital outcome that we're trying to create? Madam Chair, I think um, a lot of the the individuals, I think when they when they attend a consultation, they just had a lot of concerns. If you have different stakeholders had different concerns. Um, I think some persons were looking at like the cost of compliance and what sort of obligations it would put on them. Others looking at being able to use data in, in terms of um, being able to make business choices or economic decisions or planning issues. Um, others are looking at um, in terms of press freedom. So, so you had a mix of views coming out. And I think um, generally, I mean, the, the act, like, like I said, the act is 10 years old, a lot of things would have changed since then. And so persons wanted to know whether current issues are being addressed because a lot of these things would not have been current at the time that the act was being proclaimed. I mean, a, a lot of things, I mean, by the time the act passed in 2011, it probably would have been drafted a couple of years before and, and tweaked a little bit coming then. So a lot of things would have changed in that space of time on person's ability to use data that would not have been contemplated before is, is now coming on stream. So what you find is a lot of stakeholders, I suppose, just raising concerns and different issues. So, so you had a mix of views in terms of those looking for trade facilitation, those ease of doing business, and those who concern about protecting your, your privacy and invasion of privacy, etc. The, the, the key, Madam Chair, again, to you, the key to this is that they are not mutually exclusive, that you can be protected and still have the correct sharing of, in, of pertinent and specific and relevant information to allow for the efficiencies that 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 digital government brings. So, so the, the, the other piece about this, and I know we, you touched on it a bit earlier, is really about the education. Now, there is specific education as to what the act does and contains, and I agree with Member Gonzalez that that has to be focused and very clear. But the general idea about the, the sensitization of the population and of industry about data data protection and the associated pieces and the benefits of that and the risks involved and so on that has to start long that well you say it's been ongoing but how is it going and 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 what more needs to be done and how can we help you get that get to that point okay, um th that would have started a, a while back i think to be fair it has sort of stopped because of looking waiting to see what what comes out of the consultation and i think um and for from my from my viewpoint i think um we would have to really rely on the ministry of public administration in terms of their their policy crap data protection policy and probably have to work hand in hand in terms of crafting that policy and and a, developing a strategy in terms of rolling it out to the public ministries, departments, as well as the private sector and doing that thing. I, I, I don't think that is something that we would have the, the from sitting here in office of the prime minister, be able to look at all the, the wider implications and implement on our own. I think that is something that we'll have to do together with the Ministry of Public Administration. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Now, you drew attention in your presentation, your submission, to the absence of regulations to guide service providers by highlighting that nothing in the existing law stopped the use of their cloud services. Now, given that personal data is usually stored by the major information and communication technology companies, Google and Facebook and Yahoo, and the customers have the option to disagree or agree with the terms and condition, do you think that this matter should be left to individual or consumer choice rather than attempting to legislate? What's, what's the view on that? Oh, I, I, I don't think I, I 
to fully answer that question. I mean, you, you make reference to the terms and conditions and individuals have the, um, the, the option of accepting or they are, but I mean, practically no one reads <laughs> those terms and conditions and more or less click the box and move on. And, it, and it's, it's funny, like um, when we had the, the issue in terms of WhatsApp and people suggesting that um, look at this agreement with WhatsApp and Facebook and they should move to another platform. And most persons, I, I don't think anybody could really remember whether they clicked that option <laughs> when it came up before them. So it, it's, it's a difficult question in terms of um, domestic legislation, trying to address some of those issues when you're dealing with, with Facebook and, and those larger entities. I mean, if you follow what's going on in the news with the European Union or Australia, with um with facebook and and the use of um news articles i, I don't think it's a question that 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 i'm that i have the capability of answering i mean it, it's something that you need to consider but then you also have to look at um your uh, a, con a country of our size and our gdp <laughs> probably that's a monthly budget or some or less for some of these large entities and if you sort of put the sort of legislation that would not make it worth their while to do business in Trinidad. Those are some of the things they'll have to weigh going forward, but I, I really can't answer that question. And of course, people don't only store correct information, but they also store incorrect information. You know, as I found out when somebody was celebrating her birthday in Facebook, and I know she was ahead of me in school and she was younger than I was. So, you know, people do all sorts of things. Further questions? It's not often we get um, Mr. Sweet here with us. We have to take full advantage of him. Um, uh, why don't you, sorry, well, go ahead, Jayanti. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, yeah. I mean, um, P.S., would it be possible for us to have some sort of collated or um, form, or I don't know if it exists, so if you all have done it, a collation of all of the concerns expressed by the stakeholders um, so that we ourselves can appreciate exactly some of the I don't know if that was done, but that we could appreciate exactly what yes, because, the concerns are, because it might guide us in terms of being able to make recommendations in our reports. You could perhaps, I don't know if it's possible, share with us in a tabular format. I think that's always a, a useful way to collate stakeholder, um, stakeholder feedback. What is the concern? And perhaps if you have come up with any um, solution or proposal, or if you have any response to the concern, and then we can then perhaps look at um, making recommendations or or giving some guidance to even you know assessing whether the concerns are valid or uh, could be addressed elsewhere. Is that possible for you to share with us? Yes, I, I think we can we can present that tabula and highlight the is the main is well the main issues that going forward. Yes, of course. Thank you. Chair, can I also recommend to um, to yes, Sweet and his team? to look at Barbados. Um, I'm seeing here that they passed their data protection bill in 2019, and they are working towards full implementation of the bill. I mean, Barbados is just not too far away from us. It is a Commonwealth jurisdiction. We have similar history and experiences. And perhaps I may, might want to suggest to him that you look at you know, the work that they have done um, in coming up with their data protection bill and act rather in 2019 and see you know where we can learn from their experiences in trying to expedite what we are trying to do here and what we are discussing here sure chair um thank you member um i i know when the um the consultant did their gap analysis they were looking at both jamaica and barbados and they had noted that barbados had chosen to adopt the english of the well, the, well, the European as well the GDPR modern legislation, 
and they have advised that we could augment to some amendments or and repeal of and replace some parts of the um the data protection act in terms of a comprehensive piece of legislation to give citizens more control over their data so so that's something that they have been looking at and they also looked at some of the powers for the um the office of the information commissioner in terms of what barbados did at their act in 2018 so so that's something that that's been looked at by the consultant apart from the public consultation did you um you had a meeting i guess with people did you actually send the bill you know the act to various people to ascertain ascertain their views certain you know who may have a vested interest in, in this I would, I would ask um mr noel if he could answer please thank you sure thank you very much what i do know is that the consultation we would have sent um the request via letter to various organizations and we can um i can perhaps provide those persons who were contacted for the uh, consultations and they would have provided um submissions um to the ministry at the, that point in time um do you yeah. remember if you had the educational institutions like law school and so on because it's impacting human rights you know and they have people who have a, a great interest in human rights and they may be able to assist in that regard or did you send just a public bodies for their own regulation but just to ascertain views on the legislation to assist you sure yes we would have consulted a wide scope i know it would have been both private and the public sector and um i don't recall exactly if that specific one you mentioned was consulted but i do know that we would have taken note of both public and private entities as well and the actual list we can um look at it and provide and yeah, I strongly advise that you look at some of the educational institutions of higher learning to see what you can get from there to assist you. Members, any further questions for Mr. Sweet and his team from the OPM? Just quickly. Um, Yes. Do you anticipate that the timeline you spoke of here of September would um is it a do you anticipate that, that timeline will be kept for the feedback from the consultant? Can we can we anticipate that that would be um you know with all of the challenges we've had and time frames being thrown off and so on? Is that still on track for September 2021? Well, I I would have to say yes. I mean, so far they have, they have been keeping on track, so um anticipating that they will continue to do so. All right. Thank you. In the legislative brief, you spoke to the legal consultant advice that due to the cultural environment in Trinidad and Tobago, mechanisms are needed to prevent the abuse of power by regulators. Do you know what you had in mind by the cultural environment, the use of that phrase? Um, I would want to refer to um, Mr. Philip. Um, I, I don't know if he is looking at the um, the size of the population or not, but um, and everyone knowing each one, but I probably I'll, I'll want to defer to Mr. Philip on that, please. Thank you very much, PS. What the well, what came out of the of the of the consultation? What what one of the stakeholders had 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 mentioned is that there's not a, a a culture of awareness on the part of the large populace of Trinidad, and and that they're not primarily concerned about privacy and, 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 and how it can impact them. Now, I'm not sure what the, the consultant has in mind. So, so we have to wait as regards to the recommendations, but that was the main concern in, in terms of we understanding our, our need for privacy and, and, and how it can be impacted. I'm not sure yeah. if it answers the question accurately. No, did I hear you say that we're not concerned about privacy? Is that what you said? No, one of the stakeholders, right, raised the concern that we, well, we as a people, right, he, he was just talking from his point of view, is that the, the cultural awareness of privacy is not that prevalent within the society. 
it is not it is not our view it is not the government's view but it's just one of the view of the stakeholders from the consultation it would madam chair to you it, it would it would seem to me that what they are talking about is not necessarily the concept of privacy at a personal level but the concept of privacy as it relates to things uh, of utilization of, of data. So everybody in Trinidad and Tobago is absolutely sure that they want their information to be private. I, I don't know that that would be something that is not a, a global acceptance. What I think the issue would be is what, how that information could be used and the awareness of how it could be used properly and correctly as opposed to incorrectly might be the, the awareness of which they speak. But I'm sure people are well aware of the fact that they want their stuff to be private. I will I will use an example because in the in your submission, there are a couple of things mentioned about health. One was mentioned about the duration of time for health records in, in general. Well, with duration of time, in which how long should one keep one's health records? And then there's a further section in the submission that speaks to that there is no time duration set or established or has been proposed in the legislation to deal with the maintenance of how long you need to keep records. That in itself is something that will have to be addressed and will be addressed. But think about this, and I want to use this example. Let's uh, there, there ex exist as we speak health information management systems, some of them electronic, some of them still analog and paper based. The privacy as it relates to medical records is something that is well established. Uh, remember the Alsing who is here with us will, we could speak at length about that. Everyone assumes that the only people who has visibility to their medical records would be their personal physician, wherever it is. But what happens when you go to a public institution? What happens when you go into the Port of Spain General Hospital, the San Fernando General Hospital, etc.? What happens to your medical records then and who has access to them at that point? It, no one really thinks about it until you get into a global system. So when you talk about an electronic health management system, where if you, regardless of which hospital that you go into, your medical records will be available to healthcare professionals who are trying to help you, then in that case, it's a good thing. When someone is inquiring about your medical records for other purposes who should not be doing it, then that is something else. So you're talking about data protection to allow for the misuse of data, but while yet permitting the, the sharing of that information in the interest of, of, of the person involved. That is the, 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 the difference in where it is. I think it is that differentiation that would represent a certain level of ignorance on the part of the populace. I don't know how you feel about it. Mr. Philip, that was to you. Oh, I, I I agree totally with your sentiments, member. Totally. I didn't think it would be that simple, sir. So. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, and Madam Mr. Chair. Scotland, yes. Good morning, Madam perhaps, Chair. Perhaps as we're talking about medical record, Mr. Scotland, perhaps you could even we could even look at this. Because in all the question about privacy of medical records, I, I don't think that what was considered is that there is something called waiver of privacy. Yes, but Chairman, I have a more fundamental issue I want to raise with your permanent second. From your opening comment about us being the land of limbo and this legislation being in limbo, Chairman, may I through you ask the legal personnel and the permanent secretary whether or not the generous time frame that they'd given themselves to have the legislation proclaimed can be accelerated in light of the fact that we are now more than a decade hence. Can I ask that to the legal department and your PS? If it can be accelerated because Chairman, in my respectful view, they're giving themselves a time frame as if the act
has now, you know, has it now been drafted and everything is everything. Can I ask that firstly? Chair. Yeah. Um, okay. The, the act, yes, it was drafted 2011 and it not, um, things would not have pro progressed at that point in time. But you have a in terms of a general time frame, I, I don't think April to September in terms of drafting legislation and presenting to stakeholders is, is a generous amount of time because a lot of it, when the consultant did their gap analysis of the particular legislation, they would have pointed out a lot of shortcomings and a need for a lot of things to change. And then when you when they met with the consult with the stakeholders in March and the other issues were raised, they have to take those issues as well as their, their gap and come back with a draft. Within, you're talking about three months, which is, which is June, and then go back out to, to consultants in July and come back. So I, I don't think, yes, I understand the impatience in terms of it being implemented and passed assented to in 2011 and not being um, fully proclaimed, but we really have to deal with where we are at present, the shortcomings that have been identified, the changes in terms of the IT landscape that would have taken place with the introduction of new technology, et cetera, and as well as identifying the need for other supporting or complementary legislation to also be adjusted. So, so I, I don't think that that is something we could come, that we would really benefit by compressing it by, I mean, to, to two months to try to do all of that in that space of time. Chair, Chairman, through you, I have yes, a follow-up. Yes, if I seem to be pressing you, then you would have the right impression. The legislation that we that is unproclaimed, the data protection legislation, would you not agree with me that in light of what is being what is transpiring now, that it is now even more important for it to be proclaimed? Would you agree with me? If you don't agree, you can say no. Agree, yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Chair through you. We have precedents from Australia from England, from Canada, to say the least, where we can pattern our legislation. So this legislation is by no means novel. Jamaica, have we reached out to those other um, jurisdictions to learn from, them, for, from their experiences in order to assist us with a more efficacious process in proclamation? Have we, has the consultant reached out? Has the legal team in the ministry reached out? I, I would have mentioned that the consultant is looking at the legislation in Barbados and Jamaica in developing their, their proposal and the finalized brief. So, so that is something that, that is... <laughs> Um, <clears throat> Chairman, I, I lost Sorry. connectivity. I'm not hearing you. Okay. <clears throat> now we have a ministry that deals with digitization, and I'm wondering if that ministry can play any part, digital transformation, in assisting with speeding up the process. Does it have anything to do? Because really, a lot of it, the data, is because we're living in this digital environment. And um, I would imagine that you could be working in tandem with that ministry, the ministry of some officials from that ministry to, to try to assist, because you need all the help you can get, you know? And that may very well be part of the solution. Chairman, can we well, answer? And then maybe member Bacchus could, could give us an, an input, but let I, I want to hear legal on it because this legislation, Chairman, should not have taken so long to, to be proclaimed. It is by no means novel. Chairman, 
Thank you very much, member. It's a it's 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 a good point. But as what PS Suite would have mentioned, the consultant would have been looking at various jurisdictions, Canada, Australia, what pertains in New Zealand, and also the regional aspect of it, um, Barbados and Jamaica. Um, I want to make the point that while while there has been an inordinate delay in terms of proclaiming the legislation, and we all know why for the, for the various reasons, I just want to make a point that in terms of data protection, we want to get it right. We don't want to, we don't want to rush it and then miss the, the, the important elements of it. So we want to make sure now that the, the stakeholders, both public and private, has been consulted extensively. So when we come now with this piece of legislation, everyone feels comfortable. Now, with regards to consultation with the Ministry of Public Admin and Digitalization, we have been consulting with them with regards to the, the, the act, and we have been collaborating. She didn't mean to use that word, Russia. I don't think you meant that. No, no matter. I, I'm a, Chairman, not in this, not in this scenario. You can't this. talk about Russian ten years, no, huh? You can't. All right, Chairman. It, it 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 is like the proverbial snail walking on the peanut butter and then falling into molasses. But here is a question that I have for for legal. You know, in legislation, legal and PS suite. You can't please everybody all the time. There comes a time when you need to implement the legislation. And if persons are aggrieved, Chair, you know legal that you challenge it in the courts. But I don't think, Chair, through you, that we should be going into 2022 without this legislation being proclaimed. Do we have a commitment from the team that that will be the goal? Well, we have a time frame where the consultant would provide the draft legislation as well as a final report in September. Once we receive that final report and the final proposed legislation regulation it will be up to us to present that to cabinet and cabinet will deliberate and after cabinet has deliberated provided they, they sign off on it the, the legislative agenda in terms of the, the proclamation and the amendments that that will be that will be off my lap and back in on your that'll be on your plate <laughs> really <laughs> when was the consultant engaged may i ask the consultant will have been engaged if i'm not mistaken um december um it may have been early 2020 and there the, the, the finalized inception report would have been completed in december 2020. So once they have finalized the inception report and the conceptual framework planned and compliance with the terms of reference agreed, the work would have kicked off in terms of, well, from December 2020 to now. Thank you. Chairman, I, I still did not get a timeline for the actual, the end. I, I need an end date from you, please, sir. The end date that I could submit to a consultant would provide me with the draft legislation and the final report in September. From there, I would present to cabinet. Once, if cabinet agrees, then it will have to go to the LRC and to the parliament. I, I could only commit to my part, which is the September, October. After that, it, it's beyond me. So, so the, 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 the chair can have it recorded that we will hear from UPS suite on or before the 15th of October, 2021, with respect to this legislation. Sure. Chairman, that is a commitment that we can record in writing. Chairman, I am I didn't very... Hear, I didn't hear that from Mr. Sweet. 
Mr. Sweet? I didn't hear that from Mr. Sweet, Mr. Scotland. Well, Chairman, should I ask the question again? I could respond, if I may, Chair. Yeah. October 15th, I will be in a commission to, to report to the committee on the status of the project in terms of the, the, the commitment for the proposed legislation and the final report from the consultant. So the October the 15th day, that is to report on, on status, not, that's not the end of it. You just that, given a report. That, that, that is and that report may state that it will end in December 2021. No, that, that report would state the outcome of the consultation as well as the proposed legislation would have been received from the consultant and I would present once we receive it in the ministry, we will prepare the draft note to cabinet. I, I can't commit beyond cabinet and the legislative review committee and parliament. That's, that would be a little beyond me. Chair, I think the committee needs to be, I think the, the committee must be cognizant of the fact that this consultant that Mr. That yes, Sweet is referring to is a consultant that has been retained by the Ministry of Trade in pursuant of its own agenda. I am not of the view, based on what I've heard so far, that this consultant is looking at the Data Protection Act as a whole for full implementation in Toronto Bay. It is the consultant is retained by the Ministry of Trade um, to to make to, to recommend certain changes uh, in alignment with this policy with respect to the um, the single economic window and what has to be done so that it can become um, rather compliant with its international um, obligations with the European Union. So I'm not too sure whether or not the consultant will treat with data protection and the readiness of Trinidad and Tobago for the full implementation of the Data Protection Act. Well, I don't want to make assumptions outside of our receipt of the terms of reference. But when I hear um, Mr. Sweet, and he's talking about draft legislation, I feel a sense of confidence that we're looking at a Data Protection Act that would take into consideration the needs of the country and not just one ministry. Am I not right, Mr. Sweet? I'm just looking for, just now, sorry. Are, are you hearing me, Chair? Yes. Yes, okay. Very um, well. All right. So let, um, let's try you again. Okay. In the, the, when the consultant, after they did the inception report, the thing they would have done after would have been a gap analysis. And the key gaps that the consultant would have identified is that the Data Protection Act and issues to be considered in drafting amendments to the Act and regulations. And in prescribing recommendations to address the issues identified, they will take consideration of international best practice by the EU and the, the latest developments taking into consideration the local context and the developments in terms of big data, et cetera so that these key issues that are going to be addressed will be the key concepts and the definitions and as it relates to data sharing and standards. The consultant, apart from the public consultations they would have had, would have also liaised with the Ministry of Public Administration and Data Transformation in terms of their role that they have in terms of developing data protection policies. So all of these things would form part of part and parcel of what the consultant has undertaken. Um, the, the consultant, yes, it was in, retained by the, the Ministry of Trade and Industry because they were looking at advancing their issue. But when they realized that they couldn't, go, they were limited in how far they could go if those some those amendments to data protection act were not implemented. And therefore it was a result of their recognizing that there was a mutual interest in terms of what they were doing that they, and that since they were already trying to progress their single economic window project, they are the ones who are undertaken in collaboration with the communication division of advancing the act. So yes, they, they are looking at the broad 
definition of data protection and not just narrowly focus on issues related to, to that single economic window. Um, Chairman? The Scotland followed by Member Bacchus. Um, and then Ms. Balcaran. Chairman, the Chief Parliamentary Council must be able to bear some assistance in this matter in order to expedite it. What about the CPC's involvement in this matter? Come on. Chairman, I get a feeling, and it's only a feeling, and it could be me, that all hands are not on deck with this legislation. It is not a criticism. It's a feeling. So I will, I will be happy to be wrong about that feeling. Chairman, have you lost me? Chairman, have you lost me? No. You I, 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 I haven't. Chairman, I, I want to know if they're utilizing all the resources, if all hands are on deck, all the resources available to a government are on deck in order to produce or to bring to fruition such an important piece of legislation. Thank you, Chair. Chair, that's all my right. last question. Chair, can I add to the concerns? Mr. That... Sweet, will you respond? And um, Mr. then I will the have Mr. Baker. The CPC would deal with matters referred to it by the cabinet. So when the draft legislation has been prepared and cabinet has approved, by we have a cabinet minute, that, that is when the CPC would get involved in, at that point in time. I mean, the, the, the CPC is drafting legislation for or, or involved in legislation drafting for the entire public service. And so they wouldn't start from, from scratch. They would have to have pol um, policy, the policy document and, and the draft legislation signed off and approved by cabinet before they begin to, to work on it. All right, let's hear Member Backers now. Thank you. A couple of things. So, so for full disclosure, obviously, I, in another place, I am the minister in the Ministry of Public Administration and Digital Transformation. And as such, I am also well aware of the, the efforts of the, the FDADT ministry in conjunction with the Ministry of Communication and the Ministry of Trade and Industry in terms of the adjustments and contributions to what will be the final outcome of the of the consultant report. So again, I will I would leave that until the, the TOR is, is produced and you understand that any further context from that is required, I can add. The other thing I want to, to make clear and, and to make sure that people have an appreciation and consideration for it, it is spelled out a number of times in the submission, but it's one of the things that maybe we lose sight of. And that is the readiness of whether it be an industry, whether it be the public or private sector and or the citizenry to to, to be able to absorb and comply with the legislation that we're going to put forward. A readiness study is one of the things that, that determines uh, in, in a number of ways the type of compliance that you're going to get initially, uh, the type of acceptance you're going to get initially, and the type of pushback. And it also gives you a good guide as to how much pre-work you have to do uh, to be able to get the full efficacy uh, that you're trying to get out of the procurement of the legislation um did and and, and, and this is the ps and, and maybe to the legal management part of the, of the consultancy you know has that type of of study been done i mean apart from saying that that you know there is some low level of understanding of certain aspects of of, of privacy and so on is is there a readiness part or was that part of the report that was initially submitted that says the public sector, the private sector, the, the citizenry, and or uh, the, 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 the wider Caribbean region and so on, in terms of its readiness uh, for this type of legislation. Mr. Noel or Mr. Philip Dancer, please. Thank you, Piers. In terms of the consultancy, I, I, I can confirm that there was no um, report 
done as to the readiness of the public sector or the private sector? Would that not, would that not be something that would be of relevance in terms of, well, I mean, yes, it's legislation, we can proclaim it at any time, but it's, it's, it's efficacy and, and how, how it is accepted and, and then the compliance. And then you could find yourself in violation of something simply because you're not ready to do it. There, there has to be a consideration of that as it relates, because it, it sets up how much work we have to do in preparation for uh, the actual proclamation of what will obviously be a good piece of legislation. What is the what is the view then of of of, of yes and, and his team where that is concerned? Well, in terms of where that is concerned, I think I would probably go back to the, the issue that um, Member Gonzalez had raised before, in terms of really looking at the, the legislation, the, the final piece of legislation which is guided by the overall government policy, and getting that in place. So that when you, you go out to the public and go out to the, the ministries and departments, that, that you're very clear on what it is you're looking to implement and, and the messaging that goes to them. I think in, in the absence of that, that final complete policy document, you, you can only really treat with the general principles of privacy and some of those things that have already been proclaimed by the Act in terms of laying the groundwork so that when you're ready, to advance, that you would already have a certain heightened awareness so that you will be able to, to progress a little faster at that point. Um, but I and I think um, in terms of that readiness assessment, that, that is where the, the officer, the prime minister, would have to rely and lays more, more with in terms of the Ministry of Public Administration and moving that, that part forward as well. I wonder if anybody here present can clarify a statement that was received from the Office of the Attorney General and Ministry of Legal Affairs, which seems to go at, to be at variance with what we've heard here today. In response to the question as to whether the legislative drafting department has prepared or is currently engaged in preparing any amendments or subsidiary legislation or regulations pursuant to the Act, the response from the AG's department is that several issues regarding the constitutionality of the law and amendments associated with recent developments in the law have been discussed. The recent promulgation of laws in the European Union and elsewhere directly impact the review of the DPA. Active work, active work is ongoing with the Ministry of Public Administration in respect of the review of the act. Draft legislation has been prepared and is in consideration. Now, I am completely mystified. <laughs> so, well, I, I can't respond to that. I mean, because one under the Gazette, the, the, the Data Protection Act would fall under communication, so I'm not so I'm not aware that that was being undertaken with the Ministry of Public Administration, and I know that our our team would be lazy, would have been liaising with the Ministry of Public Administration on this issue, and I also know that the Ministry of Public Administration would have responded to the consultant in terms of when they did their gap analysis and some of the issues, and I. I don't know if I, looking at the consultant's report thus far, as well as the gap analysis, there was no mention in, in that consultancy that the Ministry of Public Administration was working on in terms of draft legislation. Well, Chair, I would want to say, with your leave, I'm sorry, um, that having regard to the statement or the information provided by the Attorney General's office, that the committee will be in a better place if we can get an update on what has transpired um, uh, from the work being done by the AG's office as well as the Ministry of Public Administration so that we can get a clear understanding as to 
the various moving parts of what is taking place on this pieces of on this piece of legislation. So we get a clear sense as to where we are as a country and the direction in which we are going. Because clearly, what um, what the Office of the Prime Minister is doing, in, and that's the reason why I said, and I continue to hold on to the view, that um, it, it is clear to me that what the, the Office of the Prime Minister is doing is more or less confined to the Ministry of Trade. And, not, I, and I, was never, I was never inclined to believe that it, it had anything to do with the general trust at which the government or, the, or, or Trinidad and Tobago is going, where data protection is concerned. So therefore, I'm not surprised of the information received by the Attorney General's office. I like your image, though, about the moving parts, because I'm seeing parts moving around, I, and I'm seeing a circular movement and, yeah. you know, collisions and, yeah. you know, yeah. which it sort of will make you dizzy. Yeah, because so you don't know, you don't know where you're going. Yeah. I think we should and ask your public admin. We need to get clarification. All of you them. You know, we need to find out if we, we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. And strange enough, you know, the same thing happened last month. You know, we got one side is saying, and then the other side is saying something completely different. And it's one government at the end of the day. And I'm sure you talk to one another. That is what we hope, Chair, not in Trinidad and Tobago. That's not our reality. So I think the consultant that um, PS Suite, um, the consultant that he alluded to um, during this inquiry should urgently meet with the Ministry of Public Admin as well as the Attorney General's office so that they can all consolidate their effort in trying to determine the direction in which we go as a country as it relates to data protection. Chairman, Chairman. Ms. Tabakas and Ms. Balkara. Ms. Tabakas, have you said your piece and we can have Ms. Balkara now or, or are you, you're uh, right? Certainly, Thank certainly. Uh, Balkara, go ahead, please. Yes, thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, please. All right. So with respect to the two issues, I just wanted to say that the Ministry of Trade and Industry has had offered to finance the project because of the loan that they had with the Inter-American Development Bank. The, at that time, the Ministry of Communication was, um, nominate, was, was named the, the lead on the project so that every a deliverable of the consultant has been passed to the team. There is a technical working team at the MOC, well, at the previous MOC, which is now part of the OPM, that was were responsible for reviewing and approving by sign by a sign off from the PS of the then MOC and now the OPM on all those on each deliverable. So it came the the sign off was from our end, not trade. So I am saying that it it was clear to us that the Ministry of Trade and Industry was not seeking, um, the project was not about the Ministry of Trade and Industry only improving trade performance and so on. It was really about addressing all the required amendments to the Data Protection Act as a whole, all right? And also the Ministry of Public Administration and, the, and Digital Transformation approached us to um, be part of the working team. So they are like a peer review and we agreed to trade agreed and we agreed we as in the then moc agreed that we would work hand in hand with the uh, ministry of public admin and digital transformation so that they would fact they will we will have their comments on each deliverable as well going along the way also with respect to the um the work of the attorney general i wanted to say that i i believe it is early in january this year we had a meeting, a virtual meeting with, a, a, I would say among the um, Attorney General, M M o OPM, and Ministry of Public Admin and Dig Digital Transformation. And that meeting was to, to how to say, was to make clear that we uninformed 
all parties that we were working, the, the OPMC was working on this project. So they were all made aware. I believe somebody from the LRC was also part of it as well. Yeah, so they were informed. I also know that the, the Ministry of Public Admin and Digital Transformation is also working with the consultant or with respect to the ETA, the Electronic Transactions Act. So it's, it's new, um, new stuff in terms of what you just announced in terms of the message, because we are saying that in January this year, we had that meeting. And also AGN Legal Affairs has been part of the stakeholders consultation as far as I recall. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for that. I'm not at all surprised by what you've said. You're getting very dizzy, why don't you? I'm no longer, no, no, I am not at all surprised. I think I've lived long enough to know these things happen. What it seems to me is that, so you would avoid the situation because I'm two months in a row, is that maybe there could be a preliminary meeting involving the various ministries that are impacted by whatever legislation so we would, you would all be on the same page because you can't have people at variance. You know, this is a public hearing mm -hmm. and it certainly does not look good. Mm -hmm. Didn't look good last month. Yeah. I didn't go into the specifics last month of, of what occurred, but I had to go into it today. Yeah. So I would advise before you come here before a public hearing, because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's all about, um, you know, having faith in the institutions that you get your act together, your story straight, so that one can be going south and one going east. All right? Thank you very much. And um, unless there are further pressing questions, I will invite closing comment from the man of the moment, Mr. Sweet. Okay, well, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'd like to, well, first I'd like to thank the committee for for having us, I think it um, would have brought out a lot of issues, especially the latest revelation. Um, and I think um, going forward, I, I would like to suggest that when we, probably in terms of dealing with some of the issues, whether it's this legislation or other pieces of legislation, for instance, this one, it would have been probably helpful if we had representatives from the other ministries also being present at, at the committee. Um, because, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't want to say any more on that because had we, if, if Ministry of Trade, Public Administration and the AG's office are all appearing before the committee, then we could have met before to, to find out these, these revelations. And I mean, I, I mean, DPS background and her presentation have more or less firmed up exactly what our position is. Um, but I would just like to close by saying that the, the OPM recognizes the, the importance of the Data Protection Act and the fact that it has been some time and the urgency with which it needs to be addressed. And I think we would um, undertake to, again, collaborate with the other ministries and departments in terms of having the matter basically put on the front burner so we go in one direction at a faster pace. I mean, we have demonstrated within the last six months a year that it has picked up pace after stalling for quite some time. And I would like to maintain that momentum moving forward until we come to completion. Thank you. So, sorry, Chair, I'm not, I'm not hearing you. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, sorry about that. Now, I would just like to end by saying maybe the watchword for this 2021 year should be collaboration. Collaboration among so many different bodies that are all joined in some way in a particular enterprise. You'd be surprised at what could be achieved. And I think this is the third hearing, uh, you know, I'm seeing, I'm making that point. And I'm glad that it came out there, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Because you can't have people going in different directions. You know, everybody will end up being lost. So thank you very much. It has been very instructive. And um, I know that everybody's trying his or her best, 
to do what is needed to do for the country. And I thank you very much for your continued service as public officers to the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. And before we leave, I would like to thank very much the, the staff of the parliament, especially my left hand and my right hand, Mr. Ogilvy and, and Mr. Lucio for their sterling service. They make life so much easier for us. They do, all the, they do a lot of preliminary work and then they have to do all the follow-up and we very, very appreciative. When I joined the parliament, I was told that this is the best aspect of the public service and they always try to show that that is a correct statement of fact. So thank you, gentlemen, on my left and on my right. And um, thank you, members of the committee who are all always happy that you can come in this COVID free environment and where we can perform. And um, I always miss though, not having you all here at the end of the session to have a little chit chat, you know, amongst ourselves. So it's not the same, but we hope that with God's grace, we will soon be in an environment where we can have a little chit chat, you know, and um, before we leave the premises. So that, thank you members, public servants, staff, and of course, our technical support. Things went very well today. We didn't have any breakdown. So that um, again, I, I understand them because we've been having some little hitches and glitches here and there. So everybody's systems, you know, they've been working well. So I'm sure Mr. Digital, in, ah, yes, Mr. Bacchus has taken full credit for something that I am not so sure he should. <laughs> <laughs> but have a good lunch, everybody, and see you next month. Thank you very much, Chair. God bless you and God bless everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair and members. Hi, members. Thank you very much. Mr. Gonzalez. Did you get I, I miss you. <laughs> I found out last week he belongs to my parish. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't see you. You went to church, Chair? Yeah? He didn't recognize me with the mask on. I came up to you by right by the altar there. Come oh. on.